All right, guys. Here's what we're going to do today. Um, you have your notes, and I want you to keep yourself organized. Remember, uh, a binary check is going to be one of your test grades with this this week, so make sure that you are organized. Um, usually, students are filling your notes, the notes up for me while we're doing the lecture. That's not what we're going to do today. We'll try something different. They're already all filled up. I want you to put them away. If you have your binder, just stick them in there, put them away. I don't want to see them right now. Put your notes away. I asked you to have a sheet of paper in front of you because while we're going through the lecture, you can jot down whatever you want to jot down. Um, write down whatever you write down, but make sure you're paying attention uh, because a lot of these are not going to make sense on their own. And whatever you jot down, you can use for the quiz we're going to have at the end of the period. Anybody have any questions? All right. So this is intro to government. This is unit one, lesson one. You need a couple of definitions first. First, we need to define what government is. Government is any institution that makes decisions for society as a whole. They make decisions for society as a whole. And these decisions affect the society in which that government rules. We have many different types of government. We happen to live in a democracy, but there's totalitarian governments, aristocracies. But that's the basic definition of government. What government essentially does is it makes decisions, and these decisions are known as policy. And we'll talk about what policy means in a little bit. But in the United States, we have different levels of government. At the very, very local level, we have local governments, like city governments. Um, McAllen is a city government. There's a county government. So the very local government, the very lowest level, we have local governments. Above that is what we have in Austin, which is a what? A state government. So we have local governments. Above that are state governments. Each of the 50 states have their own. And above that is federal government, or the national government which is located, mostly located where? Washington. In Washington, D.C. So in the United States, for examples, there's local governments, there's state governments, and there's also the national or federal government of the United States. Again, if you know this already, you don't need to, to jot things down. If this is all self-explanatory to you, then leave it alone. Anybody have any questions so far? What these governments do is they create public policy they make decisions that would affect the people that they rule or they govern over. Public policy is any decision made by government. These decisions have an impact. Whenever Congress makes a law, whenever the Supreme Court hands out a Supreme Court ruling, whenever Donald Trump makes a decision, all of those could be considered as policy or public policy. Laws, legislation, Supreme Court rulings, decisions made by the President of the United States can be categorized into this. When the city of McAllen decides to increase taxes tomorrow on the local citizens of McAllen, that's public policy already. Politics is anything that has to do with government, anything government related. When something is political, something is related to government. Slow me down if I'm going too fast. If there's some things that you may not understand, let me know. All right, moving on. So why do we care? Why study government? Why study politics? Why does public policy matter? Because government affects or impacts every single facet of your life. A lot of you right now, not just because it's 8th period, but a lot of you right now are very sleepy. Probably the reason why is during the winter break, a lot of you were sleeping at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. And now you're forced to wake up at 7 a.m. or 7.30. In your heart of hearts, there's probably many of you here that wouldn't wake up that early if you had the freedom not to wake up that early. The reason why you wake up at that time is some local government out there decided that McAllen School District starts at 8.15. If you had a hard time swallowing your school lunch today, that's because of government. 
when you go to sleep, the clothes that you wear, the car that you drive, whether or not you're going to be late for school because of traffic laws, those are all related to government. You, every single thing about your life is impacted by government. The amount of available income that your parents can spend on you, that's affected by government. So why study government politics? Because it has an impact. It impacts the people. It impacts you. But that doesn't matter. That's not why we actually study government. We study government because it's a two-way street. Not only does government impact us, we can impact government. We are a democracy. We are able to influence the policies, the decisions that government makes. So not only does government impact us, we have the ability to influence the decisions, the policies created by government. Anyone have any questions so far? So how do we influence government? Through participation. Through voting, through demonstrations, through many different methods that we're going to learn in this class. But participation matters, and it matters a lot. And we're going to give, well, I'm going to give you an example of how important participation is. In the United States, when we divide people by age group and we examine who participates, who's politically active, you could probably predict which one of these is probably going to be more active. Old people or young people? Okay. Old, older people. People who are 60 years old or older are known to be more politically active, known to be more um, likely to vote. While young people, our generation and your generation, are the least likely to vote in the United States, least likely to participate. What that entails is the decisions, the policies getting cranked out by government probably benefits who? Oh. The old people. If you look at all the benefits that they receive from government, like when they retire, they get a social security pension. When they retire, they get Medicaid, Medicare, which is health care for free. You don't have those advantages. Some of you in this class right now, in, in five months, you're going to have a problem of paying for your college tuition. That's not something government provides. Interests and concerns like that that you young people have, those are often ignored and set aside by government because during election time, you are invisible to them because you don't matter. They're accountable to these old people, they're scared of these old people, but for you guys, you don't matter. Today, if you're a politician and you advocate for cutting Social Security or cutting Medicare for old people, for most politicians, that's political, political suicide because they know most of the people that vote are on the elderly um, side and advocating for those causes would be political suicide. So participation matters. The policies and decisions that government creates is affected by participation. One of our main topics today, um, on your tests in two weeks, this is something that you're going to need to explain to me. So if there's any part of this policy making system process that you do not understand, you stop me and let me know. The policy making process is in five parts, divided into five parts. But why do I, what is public policy again? Any what? Decisions. Any decisions made by who? The made by the government. Any law, any action, any ruling made by the government is considered public policy. And today, you're going to learn how those policies get cracked out, how those policies are created. Step number one, it always starts with us. It starts with the people. We're a democracy. Policies that get created should reflect our concerns and our interests. Every single one of you have an interest and you have a concern that you want your government to address. You have problems that you want government to address. The problem is you need to be able to communicate those problems and concerns, those issues that you care deeply about, to your government. And this is where the second step comes in. First step, people have concerns, people have interests, we have problems that we want our government to address. They can address them by making what? Laws. Laws. What do we call those? Policies. policies. By making policies. Everybody good? Yes. So we want government to care about our issues, to address our issues by making a certain policy that would reflect our preference. Our problem right now in step two is how do we communicate our interests, how do we communicate those preferences to the government so that they can make policy that would be able to reflect our will. 
So we use what we call linkage institution. From the word what? Link. What does link mean? Join. Join. Connect. It connects the people's interests and concerns to who? It communicates them to who? To the government. So that they can make decisions, so that they can make policy that would reflect the will of the people. In the United States, and we're going to talk about this towards the end of the year, we have four main linkage institutions in the United States. So if I was somebody who has a deeply passionate concern about a certain issue, how do I get government to pay attention to that issue? Give me the four main ways to do so. Make a bill. Well, you want government to make a bill, right? But first, you need to communicate to the government. Con local, Sorry? Uh, local politicians and people who... You can contact local politicians, but they're not going to care about it if you just say, this is what I care about. Interest groups? Protest? Interest groups is one of them. Interest groups. What are interest? Give me an example of an interest group. PETA, NRA. PETA, NRA. Um, this is something that's obvious, hopefully. Government is going to listen to you better if you participate in forms of groups. One person may not be enough to government to care about. But if you participate in groups and pull your resources together, that's something that government should not be able to ignore. If I was somebody deeply dedicated to gun rights, which group should I be able to, should I join? The NRA, the National Rifle Association, that's an interest group. And their goal is to influence their government to make policies that would reflect the preferences of the NRA. If I care about animal rights, who do I join? Yeah. I join PETA. If I care about African American rights, who, I, who do I join? The NAACP, right? So those are called interest groups. Anybody? What else? Protests, petitions. Pro protests, petitions. <coughs> Looking for three other main ones. Get another one is another type of group. So you may have, you may know people that have similar <laughs> values, that have similar beliefs political about how parties. government should function. The second type is political parties. Political parties are a group of like-minded people that share the same values, and they advocate for policies that reflect those values. If you're a Republican, you want government to crank out conservative policies, small government policies. If you're a Democrat, you want liberal policies to be cranked out by government. So, another linkage institution is political parties. Yes, sir. Do you have a question? Okay, I thought you were raising your hand. Anybody else? There's something that's very obvious. Today, in the modern world, media is another linkage institution. If you want to communicate something to the government, media is one of the best ways to do so. Today, social media is a part of that. But none of you have said the most common way people communicate their concerns and preferences to their government. What is the most common way? Sorry? Bowie. Thank you very much. <laughs> Elections it is the last linkage institution. In 2016, when your parents voted for Donald Trump, by that vote, they're communicating to the government, I want a wall. I want lower taxes. They're communicating that preference to the government. Anybody have any questions over this? So that's the second step. If enough people care or let all care about the issue, because you've communicated them through linkage institutions. Government might pay attention to that issue and put that issue on their policy agenda. This is a third step, policy agenda. The policy agenda are the issues that government is paying serious attention to. Again, policy agenda are the issues that government is paying serious attention to. You're not going to be able to put your concerns in the policy agenda if you don't use these linkage institutions effectively. First, you need to communicate your concern, and that concern might be put on the policy agenda of government. Once a concern, once an issue is put on the policy agenda, government is forced to make a decision to address that issue. So it goes to the government. And whatever issue is on their policy agenda, they make a decision on that issue. And what, what do we call all decisions made by the government? Policy. A policy. Anybody confused? All right. Any policy, any law, any Supreme Court ruling, it doesn't stop there. It's a cycle. 
what do they do? They have an impact on who? The people. They have an impact on the people. And that impact might create new concerns, it might create new interests that you want government to address. So review. Where does the, where does the process start? What do we have? What do people have? Concerns. Concerns. We have interests that we want who to deal with. We want government to deal with, but we need to communicate those concerns. What do we use to communicate those concerns? Linkage, Linkage institutions. Linkage. Name me the four. Political, Political parties, interest groups, media, 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 and elections. Everybody good so far? Yes. If enough people care about that issue, it might be put on the government's what? Policy, Policy yeah. agenda. These are the issues that government is paying serious attention to. And once those issues get put on policy agenda, government is forced to address those issues. They are forced to make a decision on that issue, and that's called a what? Policy. And every policy impacts who? Yeah. Anybody have any questions? All right. Moving on. Talk about democracy. The United States has a government form that most countries have adopted already, which is a democracy. There's two types of democracies. There's two categories of democracies that you need to know about, direct democracy and representative democracy. Before that, where was democracy invented? Greece. Greece. What city state? Athens. Athens is the birthplace of democracy. And in Athens, they have a very different type of democracy than we have today. First of all, not everybody could participate in their type of democracy. Usually, half the population were slaves, and they're not, they don't have any rights. So, uh, men, I'm sorry, women didn't have any rights either, so it's usually um, white men of, a, of age that are able to participate. They have a democracy called a direct democracy. What's the difference between a direct democracy and democracy that we have right now? What we have right now, the answer to this question is representative democracy. What is the difference? They vote for is exactly who wins. I feel like direct is like when the people have like a, like we represent ourselves. Yeah, when we represent ourselves. We that's vote, close. Like we vote for a representative. What does government do? They make what? Policy. They make policies. Oh, a direct is when the people get to vote on policy. In a direct democracy, people get to make the policies. We make the decisions. In a direct democracy, policies are created by the people. Those decisions are created by the people. In Athens, is how it worked. Every week or so, the citizens of Athens will gather in the town square and they would create laws and they would vote on those laws. They make the decisions themselves. They make the policy themselves. Makes sense for everybody. What do we have in the United States? Do we all go to Washington, D.C. every week and make laws? No. no. Some of you have never seen a law in your life. What do we do instead? We, 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 we elect officials that would make those policies for us. And hopefully they would represent our interests. So in a representative democracy, we elect officials that would make policy or decisions for us. Is everybody good with the, with the difference between the two? So obviously the United States has a representative democracy, it's just more logical to have a representative democracy than a direct democracy in the United States. We're just too big to have a direct democracy. Alright, now the big issue today for lesson two is the different models of representative democracy. Sure, we do have representative democracy in the United States, but political scientists have different opinions about what that democracy looks like or what it should look like. And the fundamental question when we're analyzing these types of representative democracy is, how much power do we give to the people? How much influence do we give to the people? Right now, some of you might be thinking that question is silly. should be as much as possible. But we'll talk about why that may not be the case. And why some people have different opinions about how much influence should people have in the policies that government creates. The most democratic and the, more, the most open of these three models is what we call a participatory democracy. A participatory democracy. It's in the wording, guys. Don't get them confused on your test. In participatory democracy, we have broad participation of citizens. 
everybody, every individual gets to participate. Every people get to influence the government and gets to influence the policies. It emphasizes broad participation. You, as an individual, have a voice. You have a lot of say on what policies get cranked out by your government. That's what participatory democracy calls for. Broad participation of individuals. Giving um, individuals a lot of influence over their government so that the policies that get created reflect the will of the people. It gives all citizens the opportunity to participate to influence their government. And again, that sounds like a good thing. We'll talk about why it may not be a good thing, the criticism about participatory democracy. But what's the advantage? If we allow people to have a say, if we allow people to influence their government and affect what kind of policies get created by government, it empowers the individual. You have a, so, uh, you have a voice. You have a say in what kind of policies get cranked out. You're not left out. No one is left out of the process. You have some influence over your government. Next, whatever policy that gets cramped out by this type of democracy probably reflect whose will? The people's will. If we allow people to influence the government, if we give them access to their government and if we give them power over their government, the policies that get created by that government is going to reflect the people's will. So the major advantage is government policy will reflect the will of the people. Everybody with me so far? And a lot of people in the United States argue that this is what we have. We allow people to participate in elections. We allow people to have a voice. We allow, we allow people to have influence over their government. We'll talk about how that might be different. All right. There's examples of this in modern day United States. One of the main examples are town hall meetings. Um, this is usually done at the local level where people meet at the town hall and they talk about policies and they get to talk to their congressmen, they get to talk to their politicians, and they have some influence over what decisions, what policies get made by their government. They talk about their preferences and they influence the policymakers that would create those decisions. Some of your parents may have attended a town hall meeting. They're, that's a form of participatory democracy. You're giving people power. You're giving them influence over the policies that get created. Makes sense so far. Another example would be referendums, also known as popular referendums. When we allow people to do what? If you look at that picture, that should give you a clue. We allow people to vote on policies. We allow people a say on legislation. And the most common example today would be marijuana legislation. A lot of states and a lot of local governments have, may have um, allowed people through referendums to reject or approve marijuana legislation in their particular state. Give me some states that have Colorado, California. Though marijuana was legalized in those states through referendums. Who did they give a voice to? They gave the people a voice. They gave them influence over the policy that government created. Does this make sense so far? This is participatory democracy. So you might be asking yourself, what's the downside? Give me the downside. This seems like a good thing, allowing people to have a voice, allowing people to influence the decisions made by government. Give me the downside. Everyone has a this is the main problem with participatory democracy. That's why our founding fathers, you'll see later on, were not really in favor of participatory democracy or giving too much influence on, on, to the people of the United States. Because there's going to be times where government is going to have to make policies and decisions about certain issues that may be complicated, that may require a lot of expertise. But yet, you're allowing people who may not be educated, who may be ill-informed, to influence that decision. If I was, for example, getting surgery, right, does everybody's opinion matter? No. No. It's the doctor's opinion that should matter. It's the expert's opinion that should matter. The policies that are getting created in government right now are highly complicated. They require a lot of expertise. But because we allow a lot of people to have influence over their government, the policies that get created may not be good policies. 
because the people influencing that decision making do not have the expertise in order to make that good policy. Does this make sense? So in a participatory democracy, we're allowing people that may be ill-informed, that may not have the education to influence decision making, to influence policy making. And that might result in bad policies that don't solve any problems. So very good. There's another problem. So let's say you all have influence. Let's say, let's pretend I'm government and you all have influence. And we're making a decision right now on what to eat for dessert tomorrow. You have two choices. You have chocolate or vanilla. Not everybody would agree. In a participatory democracy, who tends to win every single time? The majority will win. If 80% of you decide chocolate, what happens to the 20% that want vanilla? They're going to have to suck it up. You're going to do what's best for you not. So what's going to happen is the majority's will is always going to prevail. And sometimes the majority may want to take away rights from who? From the minority. In a participatory democracy, it's very hard to stop the majority from um, exerting tyranny over the minority factions or the minority groups. This make sense? Yes. So in a participatory democracy, we may have what we call the tyranny of the majority. So a disadvantage, citizens may be ill-informed. And number two, the majority are always going to win, and that might mean that they're going to take away the minority's rights, and the minorities will always have to suck it up all the time. Next model is pluralist democracy. Pluralist. What does plural mean? Multiple. Multiple. This is the difference between participatory, number one, and number two. Participatory democracy is broad participation as individuals. We allow individuals, single people, to influence the government. The main difference with, the, with pluralist democracy is it's also broad participation, but as what? As groups. That's the key word you need to remember here. Groups. This is group activity or political participation. It calls for allowing people to get together and advocate for common causes that they all care about and try to influence the government as what? You're influencing the government as? Groups as uh, as a unit or as um, people that are uh, that have gotten together. Very good. All groups have a way to influence the government. All groups have a way to influence the government. Pluralist democracy calls for every group to be able to have access and influence over the decisions that government makes. Not everybody may have equal influence, but everybody has a way to influence. It doesn't matter if you're the NAACP or you're the KKK. You have influence over the government. You have a way to influence the government and to influence the decision that the government makes. Everybody good with that so far? Broad participation in the form of groups. That's what uh, pluralist democracy calls for. And in here, since we have many different groups, and they're all competing for whose attention? They're all competing for government's attention. There's competition involved. These groups are trying to get what they want from the government and they're competing with each other to get what they want, to get their issues addressed by the government. Today, what's the biggest evidence that we may have a pluralist democracy? What exists? We have the Democrats and Republicans and what exists? What else? Interest groups exist. Interest groups that are advocating for different causes. And what are they all doing right now? They're all competing for whose attention? For government's attention, from benefits from government. That's the biggest evidence that we may have a pluralist democracy. Everybody good? Another evidence is in the Constitution of the United States, the First Amendment. What kind of rights allows for these groups to exist and compete for government's attention? Freedom of speech. Uh, speech, freedom of assembly is very important. Freedom of petition is also very important. Our founding fathers allowed these groups to exist. 
All right, so what are the advantages of a pluralist democracy? Public interest is, ref if we allow all interests to be represented, if we allow all groups, no matter how insane they may be, let's say we have the KKK, for example, and we have the Nazi Party of the United States, those guys are also allowed to compete. They're also allowed to influence the government. But if we allow everybody to participate, if we allow everyone to have a voice to influence the decision made by the government, so as a result, it should be that these policies that government cranks out should still reflect whose will? The people's will. Because all interests are represented. All interests have a way to influence their government. So the policies, public interest, is still reflected in the policies that government makes. But there's another advantage that participatory democracy does not have. And what is that? Again, let's pretend I'm government, and you're all groups, and you all want something from me. The problem is government doesn't have all infinite resources, and sometimes saying yes to one person means what? Saying, saying no. If I say yes to the NRA, I'm saying no to the people that want gun control, for example. So you're all competing for my influence. You're all competing for me to make policy that reflects what you want. What's the problem? No one's ever satisfied. You all have influence over me. We allow that to happen in the United States. We allow people, the groups, to have influence over our politicians, influence over our government. What's the problem with that? So let's say I have one dollar, and you all want me to spend that dollar on something. Can everybody get what they want? No. no. So what do I do? Sometimes I give it to the majority. All of you are competing. You give people. Wait, what am I talking about right now? Let's back up. We're still talking about. All right. The advantage of a pluralist democracy is because all these groups are competing. Unlike in pluralist democracy. Not one group can become what? Superior? Too powerful. Not one group can become too powerful. Because if a group becomes too powerful, what are the other groups going to do? They're going to work to reduce that power. They counterbalance each other. In a pluralist democracy where all groups are allowed to compete, these groups are all competing against each other, counterbalancing each other's influence, and no group becomes too influential or becomes too powerful. If I allow you all a voice in what happens in this class, that means not one of you can have all the say. Not one of you can have all the influence because everybody has a way um, to participate or to voice their opinion. Does this make sense? I know I confused you a while ago. Don't worry about that. All right. So modern day example would be interest groups like the NRA, like PETA, the National Rifle Association. There's also criticisms of pluralist theory or pluralist democracy. The fact that we allow all these groups to exist may be detrimental to our democracy. Why? Let's go back to the example I just gave you. I'm government, I have one dollar, you are all groups, you all represent groups, and you want me to spend that dollar in what you want. I'm, all tr I'm, I'm government, I'm trying to make all, everybody happy. I'm trying to make all your interests heard. So what am I going to do? You I run out of resources. You what mm -hmm. kind of decision will I make? Yes, so. uh, one that makes you look good. <laughs> Sorry. What's going to make me look Well, not necessarily look good, but what's going to be the best way to you sure. appease all of you and make sure that none of you are offended Compromise. by what I do? Remain neutral, what does that mean? Nobody gets the What do I do with the dollar? I don't spend it. I don't do anything. If I don't make a decision, nobody's going to be angry at my decision. Does that make sense? So what happens in government? You translate this in real life. There's many different groups all competing for government's influence because of pluralism. So what happens to government? Government doesn't want to upset anyone, so it doesn't do anything. Sometimes. <laughs> and no policy gets created. So sometimes, as a result of pluralism, 
there's two things that can come about. The criticism is because there's too many interests, two things can happen. Number one, gridlock. Government doesn't do anything so that it doesn't accept, uh, upset anyone or offend anyone. Government freezes up and doesn't create any policy. What was that called? Gridlock or governmental gridlock. Guys, I'm sorry, this is my handwriting. I know um, sometimes it just scribbles. Just pay attention to the words and you should be able to be okay. What else can I do? Some of you suggested splitting the dollar, right? If I split the dollar among you, are you all gonna get what you want? No. Not really. So, Let's say I was government right now, and I know right now there's people like the NRA, there's a group like the NRA that's advocating for gun rights, and there's an opposite group that are for gun control. They all have influence over me, so I try to make, make both happy. One result would be gridlock. I don't do anything so that I don't accept any of them. What else can I do? I can make policy that would try to make both happy. But what kind of policy would that be? Is there a reasonable kind of policy no. that would make both sides happy? No. It's going to be contradictory policy. So either no policy gets made, or contradictory policies or bad policies get made. Policies that don't solve any problems. And what you should know right now, guys, is there are sometimes government has to make tough decisions that are unpopular. Government has to make decisions that are going to upset a certain group to solve a particular problem. But because of pluralism, because there's many different interests that government has to, is being pressured by, sometimes they, make, they try to make policies that try to make everybody happy, but it ends up not solving any problem. Because the real solution requires upsetting some people, requires offending some groups. But because of pluralism, because government is trying to make everybody happy, all interests should be served by the government, we end up with policies that don't make any sense that are contradictory, that are going to make the problems worse. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So an example I gave here, this is Obamacare. What do you notice right away? Sorry? A it's a lot of pages. I don't exactly know how much pages, but it's a lot of pages. Why? Because when they were making this, there are a lot of groups influencing Congress and the President of the United States to get what they want into that legislation. You have pharmaceutical companies, people that want health insurance, people, hospitals, doctor groups trying to influence this legislation. And it grows larger and larger and larger. And as a result, instead of solving the problem that it was intended to solve, it may have made it worse. Does this make sense? That is pluralism. The last one is the easiest one, hopefully. <coughs> Elite democracy. Elite democracy. In Elite democracy, political power and political influence is limited to a certain few. It's not like participatory or pluralist democracy where a lot of people get to participate, a lot of people get to influence the government. We reserve that power, we reserve influence to a select few. Political power rests with a select few. It's given to a select few. Not everybody has a say, not everybody has a voice we give it to a select few. Political participation, usually what that means is it's going to be limited to which type of people? The wealthy and the educated. The wealthy and the well-educated. All right, what's the obvious advantage? If we only give influence, the ability to influence the government, not to everybody like in participatory democracy, not to all groups like in pluralist democracy, but to only a select few that are usually well informed, usually wealthy, usually educated, what's the advantage? Better policies. Better policies. 
because they're going to be government is going to be make going to be able to make more informed decisions. They're going to be able to make hopefully better policies because the people that are influencing the decision making are well informed as well. People that argue for elite theory say that we have this false notion here in the United States that everybody's vote should matter, that your vote should count as much as my vote, when in reality that can cause a lot of problems in the United States when the people that are voting are not well informed over the decisions that they're voting for. If you were going to go to the moon, you don't ask everybody's opinion. You ask astrophysicists, you ask physicists, you ask astronauts how to get there. You ask the elite. That's the opinion that matters. And people that argue for elite democracy say, not everybody should be able to participate. We should give that influence to only a select few, the well-informed. Very good. What's a disadvantage? Doesn't appeal to the four. This is the least democratic of all the theories we're going to talk about. But here's the actual, um, the actual disadvantage. Whatever policies that this government creates reflects whose will? The elite's will. It doesn't reflect whose will? It doesn't reflect the people's will. So the concerns and interests of, let's say, poor people like she said, and the ordinary common man may not be heard by this government because we don't give them influence to be heard. The policies reflect the will of the elite. It doesn't address the concerns of maybe the common people. And you're going to see, as we cover the Constitution in the United States, you're going to see how some of our founding fathers, this is what they wanted. All right, I'm going to, give, I'm going to show you, before your quiz, I'm going to show you a video really quickly, and I want you to identify the different opinions that are involved. This is about Brexit. Anybody remember what Brexit is? Uh, so there's this organization formed decades ago called the European Union. It's an economic partnership between most of the countries in Europe. Um, they all benefit from it, they all have the same currency, and trade barriers are lowered down. A couple of years ago, um, Great Britain, or the United Kingdom, chose to have a referendum. And they gave influence to the ordinary people to decide whether or not to leave the European Union or remain. The vote came down to 51% to 49%. And they left, or they decided to leave the European Union. And this is about that. He's going to be talking about Brexit. Brexit means British exit. <laughs> Among the reasons that I heard for people wanting to vote for Brexit were, well, it's nice to have a change, and, well, I prefer the old blue passport to the European purple passport. These are the kinds of reasons people were giving for voting for Brexit. The, the day after the referendum, the most Googled question in Britain was, what is the European Union? During the Brexit campaign, uh, one of the leading politicians favoring Brexit, Michael Gove, said to the British people, you are the experts. Don't trust experts. You are the experts now. So ordinary people who have absolutely no, no knowledge of economics or politics or history decided on a 50% majority to vote Britain out of the European market, which was a, a, out of the European community, which was a very, very complicated, detailed, ramified, structures have been built up over decades, and so at one stroke, the, the British people who had no knowledge, no expertise, uh, were allowed to give the opportunity by a reckless David Cameron to vote us out, and they did, by a very narrow margin. This cult of everybody being an expert, all opinions being equally valid, is, I think, dangerous and most unfortunate. And of course, I have been accused of being an elitist because of this. And yes, I mean, uh, when you're about to have an operation, you want an elite surgeon to do the, to cut you open. You want an elite anesthetist to put you under. When you're about to fly, you want an elite pilot to fly you. When you're about to leave a 
federation of states which has been built up over decades. You want an elite economist or politician or historian to uh, advise you on it. You don't want to take the, the, the view of just any old man in the street or woman in the street. I have pronounced myself profoundly ill-equipped to vote on the referendum about Brexit. I was ill-equipped, so was the vast majority of the British people ill-equipped. In that sense, I think that elitist should stop being a dirty word, and we should start to respect elites in whatever field we're talking about. We want elite musicians to play in our orchestras, etc. I think it's bad enough to ask non-experts like me to, to, to vote in direct referendums when, all, when we are also being fed false information. What is deliberately false information? I mean, in, in, uh, Alright, so which of the three um, theories is he advocating for here? Which one would he probably least likely support? Which is participatory democracy. Everybody good? Anybody have any questions before you start your quiz? Again, you may use whatever you put down on there. How does it go? Alright, you're gonna have it first thing tomorrow morning. I'm sorry, first thing tomorrow. <laughs>